Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar Wednesdays. In today's webinar, we will be talking um, with Mindy Ely on strategies for success working with children with cerebral visual impairment, or CVI. Um, Mindy is a doctoral candidate at the University of Illinois and is also um, currently the project coordinator for the El Vista Project at the Department of Special Education at the Illinois State University. Mindy will tell you a little bit more about herself as she um, starts presenting, but that's just a little bit. And isn't she lovely there with her lovely picture? Gotta love Mindy. Um, my name is Maria Maddox, and I am your facilitator for today. Um, and uh, if you have any um, questions, you can certainly let us know. Um, uh, and ask either one of us. Uh, just a couple of things, some housekeeping duties with uh, webinars. Today's webinar, um, you will, after the end of today's webinar, you will get an email from the EI training program. Um, it, that will include with it a survey link um, that you will need to complete. That, that'll be our evaluation. And once you complete that evaluation, um, you will get a um, an email with your certificate uh, for attendance. So just keep a lookout for that. Check your spam um, folders if you are not getting an email from the EI training at Illinois.edu after the webinar. So there are a couple of places that um, that you can use to communicate with us today. Uh, one of the one of the first is using uh, a couple of different emoticons. Uh, if you look under your name, you will see that uh, that the uh, there are four icons under your name. I gotta find my little pointer here. Hang on. The first emoticon you can use to share um, any reactions you may have to something that the presenter is being said. Uh, you can click on that, and I'm gonna put a little smiley face next to my name. So if you look up under the the uh, uh, participant list, you'll see I had a little smiley face there. Um, feel free to use those at any point in time. The uh, second one will skip. The third one um, is a hand raise. So if you have um, any technical problems that you would like um, for us to assist with, um, you can use that. Uh, and I will then private chat you if you have um, for any technical assistance problems. So if you have that, click raise your hand and then look for a private chat at the bottom of the screen uh, in your um, in the chat box. Also, um, our presenter may ask you to uh, show hands if you um, if she may have a question where she's asking you to show hands of how many people have done this or or witnessed this, um, and that would be uh, another way that you would use that. Also, um, the fourth box is our polling function that I will explain here in just a second. Um, most of you have used, have been on webinars before. I recognize some of the names. Um, but if you haven't, you can use the chat box down below. Type it in and hit enter, and anything that you type will be there. You can use your chat box to ask questions. And we do ask that you ask your questions as they come to your mind. We will have we have designated question breaks throughout the um, webinar today that we will stop and address any questions that you have. Um, we ask that you put those in as they come to you because we don't want to be waiting at that break for a bunch of people to start typing in questions. We want to have questions ready to go. So, um, and um, you can also use your chat box to uh, share strategies, make comments, say hello to somebody you haven't seen in a while. Um, however, you know, use it as you would any other um, way of communicating. You can, um, if you'd like, you can make it bigger or smaller or move it around your screen if you just click on those little lines that are um, next uh, in the corner there. And uh, it'll open up a, an, an option for you to resize it. And, um, and you can move that around anywhere on your screen. All right. Um, our fourth way of, of participating is through polling function. And that is that fourth box that is under your name. 
So um, I've got a poll up here that we're going to try out. Um, we're just kind of curious to see who all is in our room today. So um, if you can go to that fourth box, click it open, and then identify whether you are a parent or caregiver, which would be selection A, uh, an early interventionist, which would be selection B, CFC staff, which is C, administrators, um, D, and then use E for other, and then put your um, what your other role is in the chat box, if you would, please. And we'll give folks a few um, few seconds to do that. Any time we do a poll, we actually ask, ask you to use the chat, the polling function, which is that fourth box under your name, and that is how you select. You click that fourth box. Right now, it has an A in it. You click it open, and those options open up, and you just select those. And um, whenever we have these polls, we would ask that you that all of you participate so that we can get some good information. Since we can't see you face to face, it's hard to know who all is in the room and where folks um, where, what they're feeling at. So we'll give um, folks a few more seconds to respond, and then we'll publish the polls to see who we um, who is in the room. So. Let's see here. All right. Uh, let's see what we've got here. So, um, Mindy, it looks like you've got a preponderance of early intervention um, providers, which is great. A few parents, um, a, a handful, a mix of CFC staff and a good mix of administrators. And I see that um, that uh, folks are typing in their roles in the chat box as well. So thank you all for sharing those information. And we will um, have other polls as we go. I uh, appreciate that. And we'll see uh, what's next. I do want to add a, a new poll here. And let me just change that function. Um, hang on just a second here. We have a question for you now as to whether or not you have ever worked with a child with CVI or cerebral um, visual impairment. So now the, the polling box has changed to a yes, no. Um, click and identify uh, your experiences with that. Thank you. I'll give folks a few seconds to do that. Folks are still indicating their their choices here. This helps our presenter know kind of who um, what folks' experiences are in the um, world of working with CBI, uh, and um, gives her an idea of uh, where she may need to clarify a little bit more. So. Okay, we'll go ahead and publish the results and see what we've got. So, Mindy, um, it looks like you have a good mix of folks who have had experience in working with children with CBI and um, more, actually, that haven't. So, um, some, some uh, mix of experiences there. So, thank you, everyone, for using your polls. We'll have some other ones that come up uh, throughout the uh, webinar, and just make sure that you use your polling function that's so right. under your name. Um, Mindy, yeah, do you want to ask? Do you want us to go ahead and do this other question as to whether or not you're currently working with yeah, children, or do you want to move on? Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. It's all yours. Okay. So welcome. I'm excited to be here um, with you today and give you a little bit of background on these little ones with cortical or cerebral visual impairment. So what I'm planning to do today is talk to you a little bit about what CVI is, and then we're going to um, talk about the importance of setting up the environment. Uh, what you'll find is these kids are still learning how to use their vision. They're still learning how to see, and especially that's true, especially in early intervention. And so we have a really important role of figuring out how to set up the environment to make that use of vision something that they try to do and also something that um, 
really meets their needs. So I'm going to talk to you about the environment and then maybe some needed supports in those environments. So we will dive right in. And I, by the way, I'm going to have you work, talking in the chat box quite a, quite a bit because those of you that have had experience with kids with CVI um, will have lots of ideas to add. And if you haven't had experience with CVI, I still would like to know what you're thinking about some of these issues. So um, you signed up for this webinar. So I'm assuming that maybe CVI was something you've heard of or you're curious about. So before I get into what it is and what do those terms mean, what is your current um, knowledge base about what you think CVI is talking about? I've put a few words on here on the screen for you, but if you had to give a quick fit it on a bumper sticker kind of definition, how would you define CVI just based on what you know about it right now? And you can put this in the chat box. So go ahead, yes, and use your chat box and respond to Mindy's question. Um, we do have, it looks like we've had someone kind of that was in uh, on the wrong webinar, and so we've gotten that all straightened out. So um, your, the webinar today is CBI. So thank you very much. Okay, I'm seeing neurological, um, neurological insult, so brain-related things, yeah. Loss of vision or incomplete use due to damage to the brain. More of a concern of how the brain does or doesn't understand information received. Yeah, that perception is a big, a big part of it. How do they function with their vision? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of brain-related things. Yeah, and how the the brain is not able to process what we see. Okay, good. So that gives me a good idea of where you're at as far as your understanding with vision. And, and you're very much on target. You're right. It has to do with the brain. It has to do with how the brain processes visual information um, and how that information is, um, is perceived in the different areas of the brain. So let me ask you that, and I'm going to give you a really thorough definition here in a little bit, but let me just ask you this first. What do you think causes CVI? So I've given you some options, A, B, C, or D, so you can use those, um, that checkbox. Uh, Maria, you might have to tell me, the fourth checkbox over. So A, B, C, or D, do you think it's traumatic brain injury? These are all causes of CVI, so, but what do you think is the leading cause? Traumatic brain injury, cerebral tumor, asphyxia, cerebral hemorrhage, and I'm specifically talking about the birth of three population. So your best guess at the leading cause. Yes, go ahead and use your um, polling function, um, which now has a little letter A in it, and select your option, the best option for that. They're coming in. I see, I'm seeing a lot of traumatic brain injury and cerebral, or, um, cerebral hemorrhage. A little bit of trivia to start off. There's yeah. actually research behind this, so it's nice to have a little bit of research to pull from. All right, let's go ahead and publish our responses there. So um, it looks like um, you kind of have a tie between uh, TBI and cerebral hemorrhage with mm -hmm. a couple of uh, folks picking asphyxia. So. I'm kind of curious to see okay. what your response is. Okay, and now so let me tell you. Um, so traumatic. So these all are causes of CVI, and we see traumatic brain injury in accidents, but also in um, abuse situations. We definitely see um, TBI in the kids that we uh, traumatic brain injury in the kids that we're seeing with cerebral visual impairment. Um, cerebral tumors we see sometimes, not very often, but we definitely see that. Asphyxia, that would include babies that are born um, with, uh, with a, a traumatic birth situation. And so they, they have had some loss of oxygen or um, situations where children go into cardiac arrest. Or, so that, that could be a result of several different things, right? And usually 
right at or around the birth. And then um, cerebral hemorrhage a lot of times happens when, um, a lot of times that ends up, ends up we see that with um, kids with, that have cerebral palsy, but, um, or cerebral palsy, but it can impact vision as well. And so we see kids that have cerebral palsy have vision issues. So the leading cause, okay, drum roll, the leading cause is actually uh, loss of oxygen. And that happens when those kids have traumatic birth. Um, and so for various reasons, they have a loss of oxygen. So just a little bit of trivia. Either way, we're still talking about damage in some areas of the brain that end up impacting how we perceive vision. Uh, CVI is the largest and fastest growing visual diagnosis. It is uh, among children with with visual impairment, and this comes from the birth to three population, the prevalency numbers are somewhere between 25 and 45 percent. And the reason for the huge gap in that percentage is the definition of CBI is, is we're still working that out, trying to figure out who we would consider to be visually impaired based on a visual perception issue. So where does visual perception end and visual impairment begin is kind of the reason for that um, discrepancy in the percentages. Other countries um, outside the U.S. are much more liberal with their definition of of what they would consider CVI, but actually um, the United States is moving in that direction. We're starting to consider a lot more processing issues to be considered CVI. Um, the other thing about CVI is it is considered a spectrum of visual impairment. So you can have CVI and be very high functioning. All, the only thing that's wrong is the visual processing. And those are kids that um, they may have trouble when things are moving and they just have trouble um, perceiving that motion and so everything just becomes blurry. Some of those kids have problems, actually very common in those kids is crowding and that kind of gets into the motion issue. But for example, if you consider, if you think about letters and how crowded letters are on a page, those kids tend to have a, a real hard time seeing the difference between the letters which really impacts their reading. And these are the kids that really is the debate, is it visual impairment, is it not visual impairment? Other, other, every other country outside of the United States has been, has been considering this visual impairment for a long, long time. In the States, we're just now starting to consider this part of CVI. Um, but it's a small percentage, although I have to say that these numbers come from the birth to three population. And so, um, catching those kids because it's not as, as, um, obvious, so catching those kids tends to happen later. So we've got 15% because we're looking at birth to three data, um, but if we looked in older populations, which we don't have those numbers, but if we had those numbers, my guess is those that had just CVI and no other, um, no other impairments would probably be a higher percentage. There's also um, a population of children in, in the most recent data, it's about 29% of kids with CVI have CVI and developmental um, delays. And then we also have, and the largest majority are those kids that have CV, CVI and um, significant additional disabilities. And my guess is that many of you in your early intervention work are seeing those children that have additional disabilities beyond just the visual issues, just the CVI. And what I'm going to talk to you about today really is probably the most, um, the most impactful for those kids that are on this right side of the I'm looking left to right on my screen on this right side of the, the spectrum, those with additional disabilities, because I want to specifically talk to you about setting up the environment for those kids to help them get used to 
using their vision and just being coming aware of their vision. So that's where we're going to spend most of the time today. Although the strategies are going to apply for all kids, they'll be most helpful for those with visual disabilities. So I'm kind of throwing around, okay, I'm, try, I'm kind of throwing the, 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 around the words cortical visual impairment and cerebral visual impairment interchangeably. But I, actually there is a difference and I want you to understand what that difference is because we had been using the word cortical visual impairment and I think you're going to hear more and more often the term cerebral visual impairment. So I want you to understand the difference between the two. Um, like we said, like I said, it, we're finding that CVI is a spectrum. In that spectrum, we have kids that have um, varying degrees of involvement beyond the vision, and that really has to do with how the brain is impacted in um, in the processing. So I'm going to try to use some tools here and point to what I'm talking about. So it, I'm going to use a drawing tool to draw. This, when, when information, oh, I'm going to change, hold on, I'm going to change the color of my pen so you can see it better. Um, I'm going to use a bright red, and, and hopefully that will allow you to, um, sorry, I'm messing with this pen so that you can really see it as I point on this screen. Um, So when the, when the um, information leaves the back of the eye, it travels down this uh, occipital or this optic nerve, okay? Then it reaches the center area that we've got labeled LGN, it's the lateral geniculate nucleus. But anyway, the, the center part of the brain. And there, the information from the left eye and the right eye, the nerve endings, Inter, intertangle with one another so that information from both eyes is mixed. That allows you to have stereo vision. And then from the LGN, it kind of splays out to each side of the brain, and that's where you see these blue, um, these blue, I'm talking about these right here, these blue, um, these are nerve fibers in this picture that go to the back of the brain. This, these, from the LGN to the back of the brain, and in the back of the brain, this area back here is called the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is the vision centers in the brain. It's the vision center in the brain. When we're talking about cortical visual impairment, it includes these blue, all these blue um, lines. These are the optic radiations, adding, and it includes the visual cortex, or, or also called the occipital lobe. That, when we're talking about cortical visual impairment, if you look on this slide here, I've got the definition. CVI is defined as impaired vision that is due to bilateral dysfunction, so problems on both sides, of the optic radiations, that's these blue um, lines here that go from the LG into the back of the brain, or visual cortex, which the visual cortex is this area in the very back, or both. So that would be the radiations and the cortex. So visual or cortical visual impairment is a problem from the LG in to the back of the brain. And this is the definition that we had been using. Um, this definition, actually, the one I've got posted here was published in 2010. But it's the definition we've been using for probably, oh, probably about uh, 15 years. More recently, um, when this was published in 2010, it was becoming a debate. And now we're seven years later, and it's very much a debate. We're really looking now at um, further than that. So just because you get the, the information to the back of the brain, then you have to do something with it. When I see an image, so let's say I have my coffee cup on my, on my desk. If I see that, I have to recognize it. Well, I'm going to go to the next slide. When I recognize it, I am using, you have parts down here that do ob object recognition and different part that does facial recognition. So I see it, I have to recognize it. That doesn't happen in the occipital lobe. That happens in other areas 
of the brain, more in this temporal lobe. I see it, now what? Well, what if I choose, okay, that choice happens in this frontal lobe, I choose to take a drink. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that choice in my frontal lobe. I'm going to use the parietal lobe to organize my visual system to figure out how to get it. Then I'm going to use what's not labeled here is the motor center to combine my vision and my motor together to reach my hand out, figure out how big my hand, my fingers and thumb need to be splayed apart to appropriately lift that cup. My recognition centers tell me how heavy that cup might be, so how much motor strength I'm going to need to pick it up so that I don't, you know, if I think it's really heavy and I try to pick it up, I'm going to throw the, the coffee all over the place. So I have to have an appropriate um, um, motor movement so that I, I have to control that motor movement so that I can um, um, pick that cup up in a steady and controlled manner. So all of that, so we talk a lot about the ventral and the dorsal stream, which that's what these, um, these arrows are kind of pointing to, the ventral and the dorsal stream. So the ventral and the dorsal stream is when that visual information leaves the occipital lobe and goes throughout the brain to actually make vision functional. So cerebral visual impairment, we're talking about the whole brain. We're talking about the whole, um, the whole package. So currently, we're, we're moving towards the word cerebral visual impairment because it's an umbrella term for an injury within the visual processing that can mean a whole lot of different things. Cortical visual impairment, on the other hand, and I'm going to go back to slides, cortical visual impairment, on the other hand, is very specific to damage to the striate or damage to the radiations. And, and when you see children that are the most severely um, impacted by their, um, by their CVI, that damage is, is quite often including this cortical area. However, it might also include some of these other parts. So this is a, a, a long time spent on a definition that you may or may not want to know, but what you have to figure out is, or what you have to understand is that it's not just getting these kids to see, it's getting them to figure out how to use that vision and realizing that they can have impairment to a lot of different functions to their vision. For example, they might not be able to recognize faces, and that means they can't recognize their mom from you. They might in other ways because they recognize the hairstyle, the shape of you, the shape of your hair um, might be different. But just looking at your face, they might not be able to recognize one person from another. And we see this in kids like in elementary school who their, their parent comes to pick them up after their soccer practice and they can't figure out who their parent is in the midst, in the sea of faces. It, this really happened. Um, another thing, they might have a problem seeing, um, focusing on one thing at a time and literally everything is blurry except for one thing at a time. Well, that impacts reading because you can only see one letter at a time. It impacts finding people in a crowd because your whole of vision is so small. And that that's issues with the parietal lobe, issues with, with being able, and also issues with crowding when things are too close together. So, and that includes, I think that includes the parietal lobe. It probably also includes um, other areas of the brain. So, so kids with, all of that to say, kids with cerebral visual impairment look very different one from another. And so it's and so it's hard to know what strategies will work with each kid because each each child is so very different. However, if we talk about the most extreme, there's some basic information that will help you a lot. And so today we're going to talk about those that are um, the most um, severely impacted by their CVI, and we'll talk about some strategies. Okay. So, um, comment, so when we think, I'm going to, if you have questions, put them in the chat box, and, and I'm going to give you, 
are. I'm going to answer those questions in just a minute. But some common characteristics when we think about CVI, there's always some kind of brain involvement. And commonly you'll see lack of oxygen, which we talked about a little bit ago. Um, cardiac arrest, which often leads to lack of oxygen. You'll see kids, and it could happen, so it could happen later in life, kids that have maybe a shunt malfunction or um, that have some, go through some kind of injury. They've been in an accident or, uh, I, I had at one time, I was, when I was working in the schools, I had a girl who had multiple impairments anyway and she was home over Christmas break and um, pulled something down on top of her. It was just, it was an accident. It was just an accident, but as a result, the, when she left, she had no visual impact at all. When she came back, she had severe, um, because of the head trauma, she had severe cortical visual impairment on top of, um, on top of the other things she was, or the mo she had some motor issues and some other things that she was already dealing with. So it can happen from injury at any point in life. There, it can happen because of infection, um, definitely a, a tumor will, or can cause cerebral issues. So just to give you a little bit of idea, there's always some kind of brain involvement. Then um, this was kind of to show you, to give you an idea of perception. So I'll just tell you, this in this picture, you can see lots of things, but if you really stare at it, you can perceive a, a whole lot of different faces. I think there's nine different faces in this picture. Well, if you really look at it, there's all kinds of faces. There's an old man, and there's a little baby, and there's a mom, and there's this whole big man. I'm not good with my pointer. There's side views of, of people. There's a front view of a child. Can you see it here? So there's all kinds of things. There's a dog down here. So you're perceive you're taking in information initially, but then if you really look, you're perceiving, and that perception goes on beyond the, the cortical area of the brain. Okay. Um, thinking. So uh, some different way, and I kind of went through this, but let me let me go through it um, in on this slide. It has some more detail. So it's the perception of information. Like I said, you can have you can have issues with recognition of people. You can have re issues with recognition of objects, but those are two different areas of the brain. So it may be that you can recognize objects, but you can't recognize people, or the other way around. Um, you can have issues with, re well, if you have issues with recognizing objects, you're going to have a hard time finding your toys. But you can also have issues finding your toys because they're too crowded together. And, and it's very, very common for kids with CVI to have um, a difficult time using their vision when, when the visual environment is very complex. And so finding their, their toys in a toy box or recognizing um, their bottle or, or not even their bottle, just their spoon when it's on a patterned tablecloth or just finding objects within their environment when there's some competing visual information. They might have a difficult time anticipating, um, I think what I meant here was routes, Find, finding a difficult time because there's issues. It's If there's issues in the parietal lobe, they have a hard time spatially with spatial memory, and so they might have a hard time getting from remembering where even even things they use every day, like where which drawer in their whole dresser of drawers, which drawer is their underwear in, or um, how do they get from their bedroom to the kitchen, or um, how do they uh, so that route finding can be very difficult. Um, it's also really uh, problematic to want to engage 
when your vision is causing you difficulties because where is our where does our motivation come from well typically we see things we want and we go for them when they're when they're infants especially when they're young children they especially are motivated by what they see in their environment and what they see others doing and so if they're not perceived seeing um, no, your audio is fine. Notes that my audio um, is you bad. just had a delay, and it's back now, so you're good. So, okay, I, I see some a comment. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I turned off my mic and turned it back on. I don't really think that did anything, but then I started talking and forgot it was off. <laughs> okay. So let me give you yeah, a minute now. I think, um, yeah, let's take a minute and let me just ask if there's about, any questions. Uh, let me scroll back here. That I can answer. Um, between all the audio questions. Liz, you had a question about yeah. what age are babies born with CVI typically identified? Or at what age? Um, I don't know if I can answer what age they're typically identified. Um, honestly, the impact from CVI generally happens, it, well, I should, it can definitely happen in or around birth. Um, and then if it's happening after that, there's some kind of a trauma or some kind of, yeah, there's some kind of trauma that happens after that. I don't know what age, I, I don't know that I can answer what age is it caught. I know in our um, national prevalency data, it looks like they're being caught around age one, but I'm not sure that that is very accurate for what's happening in Illinois because it's so different around the nation. So I don't really have a good answer to that. Other than to say what happens with these kids is they're um, obviously not using their vision. But very often, if there's other things going on, it may take a minute for the the professionals and the parents involved to say, "Wait a minute, we've got to we've got to also address vision while we're because there's a lot of medical things going on at the same time." So I don't know. I have a great answer for that. Okay, um, Megan wonders um, how much of a visual component might be present and contributing to motivate motivate. Uh, motivation uh, for children with autism. Is there any kind of correlation there? Uh, that's a good question. Okay, so that's being looked at very heavily. So what's the difference between autism and what's the difference between um, visual perceptual things? So cortical visual impairment and especially those higher, um, so on the spectrum, those that are more on that, um, on our picture, they would have been more on the right side of that spectrum. Um, so we know that kids with uh, CVI tend to w use their peripheral vision instead of looking directly at something. And so um, there's some similarities as far as lack of eye contact and things like that. But it really is two different, when you get down to it, it's two different diagnoses because CVI really is specific to how they perceive and understand visual information, whereas autism is um, more specific to um, the uh, relationship side of things, while wow. vision plays an, uh, is important for the relationship side of things. It's not the cause for the problem in the relationship side of things. So see what I'm saying? See what the difference is? Did I answer that question? I can't remember what all the details of that question were. I believe so. If uh, Megan has a follow-up, she can ask that again. Um, Peggy wants to know who typically um, finds CVI. Is it the doctor? Is it the parent? Um, well, I think a lot of times it's the parents raising questions, but the actual diagnosis is going to come from, um, usually you'll see a child go from a pediatrician to the ophthalmologist and then the ophthalmologist to the neurologist, or you might see it the other way around. A pediatrician to a neurologist and then a neurologist to an ophthalmologist. But in the end, it's going to take um, a brain, um, usually they do MRIs, so they're looking at the integrity of the brain itself. You know, if you're missing your occipital lobe, 
there's no question that there's CVI involved. And if there's um, certain other things that are, are damaged, there, it's a pretty um, certain that CVI is involved. And then they'll also often do a VEP or a VER. That stands for Visually Evoked Potential or Visually Evoked Response. And there's, from my understanding, I'm not a doctor. My understanding is there's a slight difference in those two tests, but I don't know exactly what it is. But basically, they're hooking electrodes all over um, the baby's skull. They're putting a, um, a picture in front of the baby's face, and they're measuring they're measuring electrical impulse response to visual information. And if there's great delays in that response to the visual information, then that would be one indicator of CVI. So that typically takes a neurologist, um, but, but an ophthalmologist could certainly perform those tests. So sometimes, sometimes it comes through an ophthalmologist. Okay. Um, thank you for those. I don't see any other questions pertaining to CVI uh, coming up, so I think we can probably move on. But folks, if you do have other questions, please feel free to type them in and uh, related to CVI, and we will uh, address those as um, as uh, at our next break or if Mindy sees them come up and, and can address them at that time. But um, So please keep your questions coming in. Thank you. Uh, okay. So I want to talk to you about the importance of the environment. It's really because um, children learn a lot from observation of their environment, and then that observation of environment, um, they can mimic things, but that all observation also motivates engagement within the environment, and then that engagement, those experiences, lead to learning. So we really want to think strongly about how do we provide an environment that encourages learning for kids with CVI, okay, that encourages them to want to be involved in their environment because that's so important for learning. Um, and I want to talk to you specifically about what I'm calling the hard environment in the soft environment. And so I'm going to go into detail into both the hard environment and then we'll go into detail in the soft environment. So this, this slide is just kind of a bird's eye view of what we're going to do over the next 30 minutes, okay? Um, and I will tell you the underlying factor for all of this is the importance of simplicity. And this is especially true for kids that are young because they are still learning to use this very confusing sense of vision. For a child that doesn't have CVI, vision's not confusing, and they develop it very quickly, and they develop it without, really, without much interference from us, just being in the environment. But for these kids, we have to be very intentional about providing them with an environment that is going to, it's almost like scaffolding their learning. We start really simple, and then once they get that, once they, they like their brain's figuring it out, oh, at first, you see him just saying, oh, look, I have vision. This is something neat. And it's it's fun to watch those babies because when they first see something, they usually giggle and they're, they're just so excited when they all of a sudden see something. It's just new to them. So we really scaffold their learning. We are um, making an environment that's very simple. And then we don't always want things to be simple. If they can see it, then we certainly can make it more complex. So um, simplicity is the key. And... A lot of that has to do with highlighting what's important, what we want them to see, making that easy to see, um, reducing other competing sources, because I'll tell you that when we mix vision with the other senses, for a child that has CVI, a lot of times they shut down their vision. So just reducing the competing sources is a huge help. And then giving them time to figure it out. So just slowing our speech, slowing our movements, slowing our um, wait time for so giving them time to process. And then being very aware of their perspective. So from their perspective, they need to have, from, from their face out, needs to be simple. So let me give you an example. One time I went to go do an evaluation on a little one who had CVI, and I wasn't even thinking, and I wore a sweater that was um, red and white and black, one-inch, bold stripes. 
So imagine what that did. That poor little thing, she, her red, red, black, and white are the easiest thing for our visual system to see. And if you don't have a lot of control over your vision, you cannot look away from red, black, and white. She was zoomed in on my sweater and literally could not turn her eyes away from my sweater. I ended up having to completely hide behind the couch the entire time I was trying to do that evaluation because she couldn't look away. So you have to think about what's their perspective. Well, their perspective is you. So what do you look like? What are you wearing? Do you need to put on a black smock? Do you need to um, cancel out some of that background visual noise, as we call it? So simplicity is definitely the underlying um, thread that you'll see in all of this description of the environment. So getting into the hard environment, that's the external environment. So what does the room look like? We're going to think about the sensory inputs. We're going to go through them one at a time. So visual input. We know that kids with CVI are, well, we know that lighting is very um, an easy, it's an easy thing for our visual system to see and it's very attractive. Almost as easy as that is things that are reflective and almost easy as reflection are things that are really high contrast. So let me think through that with you. So if I think of things that are lighted, things that are lighted, there's a lot of toys that are lighted. Um, you can put a, a lamp over my shoulder and highlight whatever I'm looking at and that makes it somewhat illuminated, it definitely increases contrast, but um, we a lot of times use a light box. So if you can imagine a tracing table, you know, when you're doing, people that are doing negatives, picture negatives, um, a tracing table is has got a light behind it and you can put things on top of it. That kind of um, light, and then you can put whatever toys you want on top of that and they're going to be highlighted because they're illuminated because of the background. So lighting is really helpful. Things that are reflective would be things like mirrors are reflective, but uh, so are mylar pom-poms, shiny pom-poms. Um, um, you can get mylar anything at the right time of year. So reflective things are, are very attractive and easy to see. So they're good for, you don't want the whole environment to be that way, but you want what they're trying to focus on to be that way. Also, I will say high contrast. Also, I'll say that sometimes a specific color is attractive to them. Then, now, there's been some research that has suggested that yellow and red are the favorite colors of kids with CVI. There's been other research that has said, no, that's not true. I will say that in my experience, for many, many of the kids, red was definitely a motivating and easy to see, easy to process color. Not for all kids, but it's something that I consider when I go in. I usually start with red, and if that works, I'll stick with it. But I'm going to try out other colors and see if there's something that that child is more um, attentive to. And if they're attentive to it, then I'm going to make things, like say I'm feeding them, I'm going to make the spoon red so that they can see the spoon coming to their mouth. I'm going to make the toothbrush red so that they can see the toothbrush coming to their mouth. It gives them time to anticipate what's getting ready to happen. Um, also, we have to think about complexity. So how complex are we making that environment? Meaning, are we showing them one item? Are we showing them ten items? Are we showing them one item on this crazy striped sweater? Are we putting on a black smock and showing them one item with the background being a black background? That's definitely easier to see. If I go back a slide, in this picture, we've got, we've got, we've cleaned up the visual environment by putting um, they, they put a black uh, cloth over the shelves just to clean up some of the visual environment. So when that child is playing on this carpet, their visual environment, most of the visual clutter is higher than what that baby's going to be looking at. If you look just at this low range where that baby's eyes are going to be, there's not a lot of noise, visual noise, down this high. All of the visual clutter is up here where their child is not going to be looking. Um, so that's complexity and clutter. And then also distance. If you're seeing something at near point, so about uh, 12, 18 inches, that, because of the distance, gets rid of a lot of the visual clutter. 
that when you try to look at something that's farther away, you've got a whole lot more things to intentionally not pay attention to so that you can pay attention to the one thing in the distance that you're looking at. So that takes a lot more visual concentration and a lot more visual work. So if you, if you um, attend at the near point, you don't have as many things to try to um, not pay attention to. You don't have as many things to visually avoid because that one thing is larger in your visual field. And I will have to say, so here's one little girl I was working with. Um, she was on her mom's lap and her mom was talking about how she t had the ability to crawl and she had the she had all the motor ability to do these things, but she never did. She stayed where she was, and she didn't get out. She didn't move. And um, so she, well, she was very intent on this one orange toy, and she was playing with it. And so um, I, I um, got it from her. And while I was telling the mom about the importance of distance and, and cleaning up the visual clutter in the background, while I said that, I dropped a black towel in front of my, in front of me, um, so that that orange toy was just, so the, the baby was only looking at the orange toy with the black towel in the background. That little girl jumped off her mom's lap and literally crawled as fast as she could across the across the room. What was the difference? The difference was we made the we got rid of the complexity within that environment, the visual complexity, and we used something that she already knew, she was familiar with because she'd been playing with and she'd been chewing on it and she'd really been tactually exploring it. And there was a lot of contrast. I was using that bright orange toy against a black background. So you can get them to look at a distance, but you have to really pay attention to the way you set up that environment. And I've seen that with other kids too. I mean, kids that, when parents tell me their child will never look beyond um, beyond about three feet, we, we, if we manipulate the environment, we can get them to look at a distance. It just isn't something that is usually easy to do for the child in their natural environment because it's usually visually messy. Um, and then some really basic things also is movement. Um, and movement is different with kids with CVI. Some can see movement, some can't see movement. Um, but if you give something a slight bit of movement, it kind of attracts attention. And this probably happens for you as well. You're driving your car and, and on, in your left peripheral field something moves, boom, your head goes that direction. We're very attracted naturally to movement. So when you add a bit of movement, that often kind of awakens their visual senses and makes it easier for them to see. Um, so we want to use movement. Now, you have to be aware, though, that, that a lot of kids that have issues in their dorsal stream, in that upper uh, part of the brain, if you have, if the movement is too many things moving or if the movement is too fast, they won't be able to see it. In fact, there's a lot of um, reports from older kids who uh, they, when they're playing sports, they, the ball, they see the ball, it gets kicked or hit or whatever, it disappears, and then they see it again when it reappears. So the fast movement, they absolutely don't even see when it's in motion. So when we're talking about movement, we're talking about a slight, slow bounce of an object that's just meant to get their attention. Um, we already talked about lights being important. The other thing I didn't mention was visual fields. A lot of these kids have um, odd visual viewing fields. So they might not use their central vision. They might use their lower visual field. And we see that a lot. So they'll do, they'll look at the ceiling. It looks like they're looking at the ceiling, but they're actually using that bottom peripheral field to, to see what's in front of them. So just knowing what their visual field is will help you know where to place objects and, um, uh, uh, be aware that it looks like they're looking away, but maybe they're not. Now, and having said that, I will also say that a lot of times in very, very common, you'll see these kids look at something, and then when they go to use their motor, so when they go to reach for it, they'll look away and reach without actually looking at the object. That has to do with with the complexity of trying to use your vision and your motor together when you've got injury to 
um, the visual motor centers of your brain, and that's so common in kids with CVI, and so you see them looking away. So when I'm talking about visual fields, I'm not talking about that drastic of a look away. I'm talking about a lot of these kids will, will just, they'll use their lower field, or maybe they'll use one eye and not the other. So you, it's, you should talk to the vision person. You, you have a, a, a DTV, a developmental therapist vision on the case. They've probably done a lot of evaluation to try to figure out what visual field the child uses, and then that'll help you figure out where to place objects. Okay, so um, we talked about visual inputs. Let me also talk to you about tactile inputs. So we know that kids that are CVI, um, that have CVI, especially if they have the most, um, um, most impact, those that are more impacted by CVI, they tend to go through this stage of learning to be aware of their vision. They're just learning to look. And then once they learn to look, and they go through this cycle daily, um, as they're, we're kind of what we call warming up their vision, you'll see them go through this cycle. And then over time, you'll see them go through this cycle, and the learning to look part shrinks up. They don't have to do that. They don't have to work so hard to, to find something or to see something. They get better and better and better at that. So there's a, a, a bigger long-term progression through these stages, but there's also a daily um, progression through these stages. So they'll get to, they'll learn to look, so they'll figure out something there, and then you'll see them go through a tactile exploration. So they'll reach out, they'll touch, and a lot of times when they go through that tactile explora exploration, they'll turn their eyes away. Um, and then, once they've done that, then they'll be what we call um, um, learn, uh, learning to look and looking to learn. They'll look to learn. So, so the first stage is learning to look. The second stage is tactile exploration. And then the third stage is looking to learn. So in that looking to learn, you'll actually see them interacting with it, um, um, hopefully doing something functional, like um, if they're feeding, maybe pulling the spoon to their mouth, or if it's a toy, maybe mouthing the toy, um, or pushing a button or something like that. But this middle stage, this tactile exploration, is really an important piece of processing that visual information. And we've seen for many kids the importance of this tactile input. I think it's something that we weren't realizing early on when we were working with kids with CVI, but it's something we're becoming more and more aware of, this tact the importance of this tactile stage. It's very important that we're quiet during this tactile stage because if you mix auditory, you'll see them shut down their vision completely. So um, this tactile exploration, we, that impacts how we, how we set up their environment. We want tactile things to be interesting, not just hard plastic, but different textures. Um, and so in this one picture, you see this, um, this blue ball. It has some interesting texture. But things that are more rubbery, things that are soft, things that are just uh, give them some variety, some reason to tactily explore things. But that tactile exploration is going to put together, it's going to make sense of in the first stage they were learning to look. So that tactile exploration is going to make sense of that visual arousal that they got in the first stage. Um, it really needs to be child directed. They have to explore it. They've done um, different studies, not in kids with CVI, but just different studies. And if we are taking their hands and all over an item, there's, there's no brainwave activity that is beneficial for learning there. They have to actively explore it themselves. So it's our job to really pay attention to the environment and make sure we are motivating them and giving them something exciting to touch and explore. That's where we come in. Not We don't come in by... Um, taking their hands and rubbing it all over something. That's not what's going to do it. But it's important to give them time to do this and spending time tactily exploring. Then the other thing we have to think about is auditory input. So sound is um, very, uh, they'll turn off their vision with competing sounds. It's very hard to mix the sound and the vision. And there's different theories about why this is, but for whatever reason, auditory is very difficult to mix 
in when you've got CVI. So think about the auditory environment. Are you talking? Are you saying, oh, good job? I mean, what we're trying to be encouraging, right? We're, we're saying, reach out. It's a spoon. We're, we're giving them all this verbal. When they're learning to look and tactfully exploring, we can't do that with kids with CVI. We have to turn off our voice. We can turn it on later. Right now, when they're, when they're learning to look and when they're tactfully exploring, we have to let them do that without voice. Unless, I mean, it's not all day long. All day long you can't spend trying to get them to use their vision. But if you're doing something where you want them to use their vision, then you have to think about the auditory input. So our voice is one of those, and that's probably the hardest one to get away from because we're so used to using verbal all the time with kids. Um, the other thing is TV. If you've got a TV on, that's, that, that'll that shut their vision off. If there's a lot of environmental noise, if there's um, lots of kids, other kids playing, if there's, um, I don't know, a lot of people in the environment, then if that's the case and it's not something that you can control, this might not be a good time for a visual activity for this child because that competing um, environmental noise may turn off their vision. So mu in music, the fourth block is music. This is a sometimes. Some kids with CVI do great with music. Other kids with CVI do not. So this is something you'll have to be a detective and kind of figure out. So is music a help or is music a hindrance? when the child has CVI. You have to pay attention to that. And you can tell, if, they're the, if auditory is a problem, they'll shut their eyes when the auditory happens. They'll turn away when the auditory happens. So you might want to pay attention to that. Um, and then lastly, as far as the, the external environment, is just the environmental activity level. Sometimes we can control it, and sometimes we can't. If you're in a busy grocery store, this might not be a visual opportunity for a child with CVI because it's too much. They can't, you can't control it. They can't control it. They can't understand it. And so you'll see them, and a lot of times you'll just see them shutting their eyes through that whole entire um, activity. And that's okay. They can be a tactile child at some points in their day. It would be exhausting for a child with CVI to be, have to be visual all day long anyway. Um, but other things, like maybe you're at a family birthday party and it's just visually too chaotic for them. Um, maybe there's a lot of noise and that shuts their vision off. So when the environmental activity level is high, be, be um, cognizant of the fact that that might be too challenging to expect them to do even things that they're used to, like visually seeing the spoon come to their mouth or um, um, finding their favorite toy. So you might have to switch gears at that point and and interact with them as if their vision wasn't working. Okay, so I have talked for a long time and I want to get your input. So I'm going to ask you to use the chat box to throw out some ideas. Let me give you one. So given those, the uh, what we talked about the visual environment, the auditory environment, the tactile environment, what could you do during a daily routine like brushing teeth that would help a child with CVI use their vision? So I'm going to give you this one and then I'm going to have you do the next one. So toothbrush time, brushing teeth. I would probably use a red toothbrush or whatever color their, their favorite is. I'd use a red toothbrush. I would use the same toothbrush every time. So they're used to it. They've done the work to visually figure it out. They don't have to do the work every day. So I'd use the same toothbrush. I would think about the bathroom environment. I would make it very, very simple. So I would not have a whole lot of things hanging on the walls around where that routine happened. Or if I did, I might use some kind of a barrier to calm it down for that child. I would probably not run the water while I'm brushing teeth because that might, well, I'd have to check it out, but the water running might be auditorily too much for that child to participate visually. So I think about the auditory environment. Um, so those are some things that might help a child with CVI participate in a toothbrush activity. So let me go for another one with you. How about in a um, play? So let's say this child is in the living room and 
is going to play with some toys? What are some things that you could do to this environment, the ones that's visually on the screen, what are some things you could do to this visual environment to help a child with CVI interact in this visual environment? And you can use the chat box to respond. A little bit of time to see uh, what they come up with. So it looks like we've got a dark rug for contrast, reducing the clutter, separating the toys so they aren't cluttered together, um, fewer items, fewer colors, bird color toys, mm -hmm. remove all toys except red, giving a lot of responses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. And you're, I like what I'm hearing. It's a lot of the, uh, a lot of great ideas. So we're decluttering and we're focusing in on whatever it is that, um, that we're playing with. Yeah, great. And you've got some ideas for in, including things that are lighted, reflective. Great. Okay. So, um, here's a whole bunch. You know what? I'm looking at the clock and we're not going to do these, but, Here's a whole bunch of different routines that, that if we had a whole lot more time, I'd have you go through. I'll just tell you the answers to these. You can chat in the chat box. I'll tell you some answers, and I would love to hear your ideas, too. So reading a book. We, we read to all kids, right? So how do you make – but book reading is very visual. How do you make book reading an interactive time for a child that has cortical visual impairment or cerebral visual impairment? Well, you can do a lot of things to reduce the visual clutter of a book. You can put a book on a lighted background. We actually do this a lot. If we have a light box, we can put the book right on the light box. We can make a book that is um, that is somewhat translucent. We we use um, what those those old overhead sheets. We can make a book out of overhead sheets and put it on the light box. The child that has to have light that makes book reading fun. We can use, oh, Penny says, use feely books. Yeah, we can add a lot more stuff to our books. We can add three-dimensional things. If you attach objects to the page, that makes the books um, three-dimensional, and that is very interactive. So we've included that tactile um, sense in there. You can make the, you can buy a roll of duct tape and make any baby board book, book into a, every page is black, and now you've got, a very hard, very sturdy, totally black book, and you can attach whatever you want to the pages. So you can attach a toothbrush. You can have a daily routines book, and you could attach a toothbrush to a page. You could attach a wash rag to a page. You could attach um, a, one of the child, a small bath toy to the page. And now you now you can use a book to talk about the bath time routine. So um, if you've got a book about Elmo, if you get the duct tape out and get rid of all the clutter on the page with the duct tape, and you can put Elmo's face on the page. Or, I mean, you whatever that book was, you can put, say, we call them salient features, so the primary picture and block out the background noise for each page. So then you have to buy two books and cut one of them up and all that stuff. But you can have Elmo's face on Velcro, and then you could move Elmo's face from the left page to the right page or from one page to the next. So reducing the complexity in the book makes book reading fun, even when vision is a challenge. And boy, is that exciting to get a child looking, still interacting and turning pages. You still have the words so that the, you're using that routine of the words and you're getting that um, the fluency of the reading there. So, okay, let me switch gears and go to the grocery store. Grocery store might not be a visual time for this child, but if it is, if he's to the point where we can handle the grocery store, then you want to bring up bring objects to him. So in the um, in the um, the produce section, you can touch all those fruits, and they smell, and they and they um, taste, and all of those things, and you can make that an interactive experience. But it's going to mean that you're bringing the items to the child. You might have a black folder that you put on the um, child's, you know, if they're sitting in the front of the grocery cart, you may have a black folder that you put down so that you're showing the items on the black folder and that's going to make them stand out and cut down on the visual clutter. Um, the feeding routine we talked about, making using the same toothbrush. If you put a, a light, a flashlight on the handle of a spoon, a pen light on the handle of a spoon, a lot of times kids who can't self-feed because they can't see their, their spoon from their bowl from their food, I've seen 
a handful of kids who we put a flashlight on the handle of the spoon and within one session they were figuring out how to scoop because they could see where the bowl of that spoon was going. So, um, but think also about the light and um, do you need to put a, a black tray down to make their bowl stand out? Do you need to think about the color of bowl you're using? Are you feeding them mashed potatoes? Don't use a white bowl. Use a dark colored bowl so there's some contrast there. So see how I how you, you're just using those basic foundations of what does their environment look like? Simplify that environment. Get rid of the visual, auditory clutter. Include the tactile. Also, I didn't mention very much, but you really have to give them some wait time. Give them some time. And, that, and what I mean is just wait silently. Let them visually process before you're actually requiring them to act. So those are important pieces. Oh, here's a, here's a book, and you can use objects to go through that book. So is there any questions before I move on to the soft we, we did have a couple of questions that I wanted to cover. Um, Tanya was asking, would you suggest e-books on iPad, um, uh, for example, for this uh, age group? Oh, absolutely. A lot of people have started using e-books. In other, there's, there's various iPad apps out there that are really simple and in, encourage kids to interact. Um, I'm going to say, though, to think carefully about how much you're doing that because, um, you know, screen, visually two-dimensional um, is, do, is different than interpreting your world. And so if we are encouraging visual activity, there's, we just don't know, we just don't have the research to support that building a two-dimensional visual capacity is doing the same as building three-dimensional visual capacity. So, so I'm hesitant to spend long hours of the day on screens with little ones, especially when vision is such an important piece of development for them. Hey, um, thanks. Let's see. Um, I'm kind of going back here. Christine had a question um, about well, uh, she's working with a child with CBI who's recently been identified with retinal decline, um, possibly related to a medication side effect. She's wondering about your thoughts on how two different diagnoses uh, impact a child's vision. I think I've got that clear. Oh, yeah, that's a tough one. Goodness. So, I mean, I would just stimulate away because um, that retinal decline you're not going to be able to do anything about. But um, the CVI, you can always, well, well, so CVI, so CVI is the only visual impairment where we actually see improvement, and whether that's improvement in brain um, connections or if that's improvement in function is still up for debate, although we really think it's improvement in brain connections. And so um, I, I would, I, I think I would stimulate vision and get that tactile in there because you can't do anything about the retinal decline if it's based on um, a different diagnosis, but you certainly can use, with the CDI do diagnosis, you can certainly increase those um, connections. Okay. And Peggy had a question about um, when you were talking about um, learning which visual field the child uses, can you elaborate a little bit more, give some example, more examples of what you mean by that? Yeah, the visual fields are really weird in kids with CVI, and it's not a visual loss. Well, the child with CVI could certainly have visual, have retinal detachment, detachments just like any other child and have a true visual loss. But for the most part, um, CVI is not going to cause a visual loss. It's going to cause visual neglect. So just like, I don't know if you're familiar with the motor neglect of a child that has had a stroke or something like that. So we can work so what you're, what you're generally going to do is figure out where the neglect is. So let's say they're not using their upper field. Then we're going to start with objects in their lower field and then move them toward their upper field to encourage them to look in that direction. But if you're not the DPV, that's probably not what you're going to be doing. What you're probably going to be doing is, um, is no, realizing that, okay, they see in their lower field, so I need to be presenting objects in their lower field. And um, their eyes are up, so I'm not going to keep telling them to look at me when I know that their vision is in their peripheral field and so therefore they need to look up in order to see me. So they, they tend to, it's very common that they use their lower field and neglect their upper field, but you will see other things. I had one little girl who used her one eye for 
near vision and the other eye for distance vision. And uh, literally, if we, if we, because she was going through patching, if she, if her mom patched that near eye, she was like a blind child when we were trying to play because she just could not see her near environment with that, that, that eye that was so used to looking at distance. So it's a matter of, um, talking with the vision person and really getting a very, very good understanding of where they see and how they see so that you know how to present materials to allow for learning. Hey, um, and Megan had a question, but I think your answer addressed this. Your, your answer just now addressed it. Her question was how to address that first stage of learning to look. And so I, I think that's your answer. If not, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on that, but how to address the first stage of learning to look. Yeah, the learning to look is all about, so I don't want you to think that we're just doing vision stimulation. I want you to understand that we're learning to look, which is just, I could also use the words awareness of vision. Maybe that's a better description. But we're not just stimulating vision. We're also then encouraging that next step, which is using the other senses to explore and then once they've done the exploration, then we're using that vision to function, um, which could be play, it could be looking at books, it could be brushing teeth or whatever the function is. So, but that actual learning to look is all about us setting up an environment that makes it easiest for them to see. So that learning to look is all, is really what we're talking about. That simplifying the environment, um, making whatever it is that they're looking at really stand out for them and then giving them wait time to do the processing to figure it out. And a lot of times you have to add some motion while they're doing that processing. Okay. Um, there were a couple of comments, um, but I think we can probably move on. And um, there was one thought comment about why kids are drawn to cartoons. Um, and maybe you can address that as you move on. Yeah. You know, a lot of times people think that, think that photos are the easiest thing to see. Absolutely not true. So the, the development visually is, um, is two-dimensional are easier to see, and then photos are the last thing because you, that's, that's two-dimensional and very uh, detailed. So they're going to see, and, and actually kid, kids without visual issues, I think they see in the three-dimensional first, but kids with CVI have a hard time in the three-dimensional because it's so complex. So most definitely cartoon pictures or two-dimensional line drawings are definitely easier to see than anything. It's the, it's the least complex thing to see. So, okay. Um, so the soft environment, and I'm, I'm, I am atten paying attention to the time, so I know I've got 10 minutes, and that's okay, because really the soft environment is, um, is easier to talk about, or it'll be faster to talk about. So we're talking about, when I say soft environment, I'm talking about all those things that make up the atmosphere of what it goes into the environment because that's just as important as the hard environment, which are the materials in the, the physical environment. So in that soft environment, um, we have to think about the, the child's physical comfort. If they're struggling with their motor planning, if they're struggling with their um, pain as far as their how they're sitting, if they're struggling to sit up, to hold their head up, you probably are not going to get a lot of vision out of them. So if you're working on sitting and you, because they've got motor issues and um, just be aware that you're going to have to give them a whole lot of visual supports because vision is going to have to be easier if the physical is harder. On the other hand, if you're working on something that you want to be very visual you and you don't care that they're working on the motor at the same time, you want to support their motor completely. Wherever they struggle with motor, you want to support that motor so that they can focus on their vision. So you just have to decide what the purpose of your activity is and, and then support them um, um, appropriately. So figure out whether you're supporting their motor or supporting their vision, but to try to get a child with CVI to struggle with both at the same time is not going to be very successful for you or for them. Um, also think about the, the calm. There, you're going to have to have a, an auditorily calming, a physically calming, and um, just an atmosphere that is comfortable in order for them to be 
completely comfortable, not on guard about anything. We don't want startle effects. That's going to turn their vision off. So get them in a comfortable position. Get them in a comfortable auditory environment. You, they need to be comfortable with that, with who they're working with. I always encourage that it's the parent that is interacting with the child because I am coming in once a week or once a month or whatever, and if I establish that relationship and they can do it with me, it's really not helpful because I'm not there enough. The parent is there all the time. They already have a relationship with their child. They are the ones that should be, that's the relationship we should be supporting. And so I want the parent to be doing the activity, and I'm going to provide some support as needed. But the other thing is the parent usually has better ideas than I do. So a lot of times we'll talk about it, figure out what we're going to do, and then the parent does it, not me, and then they may do it differently than I would have done it. But that's okay. A lot of times the way their their way they approach it are is better than the way I would have approached it. So I can learn a lot from them. Um, and then the other really important thing, and this goes along with comfort and calm, is familiarity with the object. So I told you earlier about the little girl who I used the orange toy, pulled it across the room, and that got her crawling. Um, that worked because she knew and was comfortable and recognized the object that I that I used. That recognition of objects takes time with a child with CBI. So they you it, you're better off using things that they're familiar with. Okay, specifically, I think a lot of PTs. I think a lot of the work that PTs are doing. If a PT is using an object to encourage um, a child to hold their head up or encourage a child to um, for trunk control, you really would do much better to use an object that the child is familiar with and likes because now they don't have to do the work to figure out what it is or to figure out if it's anything they should be caring about. So um, that might mean you leave some stuff with the family so the child can really investigate it, can really um, become familiar with it for a week before you do something with it. Or it might mean, depending on the ability level of the child, it might mean that you could give the child, um, you know, 30 seconds to investigate it before you do something with it. So just think about how the child had, what time the child has had to, to um, recognize and become familiar with the object. And then um, we want to, we're not just stimulating, I said this earlier, we're not just stimulating, we're not just stimulating vision. We're inducing and providing um, opportunities for curiosity. That's a developmental milestone. We want the children to be curious. So think about how exciting the objects are that you're using. Are they tactically interesting? Do they produce interesting sounds? Oh, you know what? That makes me think. I said be careful of the auditory environment. If, an, if a toy makes a sound, that's fine. But while the child is trying to get the toy to make the sound, you need to give them the visual quiet time to or the quiet time to visually figure it out. So using a toy that's going to eventually make a sound, you know, when they push the button and it's going to make a sound, if they like sound, that's phenomenal. Don't think everything has to be quiet. Um, and let's see. Then active and get uh, let's see, I'm trying to I'm reading my slides here trying to figure out where I was going with this. So your um, active engagement with these kids, you have to give them processing time, which we've talked about a lot. You've got to give them wait time to figure it out. It's helpful if they're familiar with the object. It's helpful if they're familiar with the people. I think using parents is the best way to do that. And then it's also helpful, what we haven't talked about, is if they're knowledgeable about the routine. So if you will have a specific um, we do, so let's take teeth brushing. So if they're going to brush their teeth, they always sit in the same spot, turn on the water, get the toothbrush wet, turn off the water, put it in their mouth. So if you have a specific routine, that will help them know where to look, and it will also help them know what the environment looks like. Um, that will just aid in their ability to visually follow what is going on. So think about the routine, establish the routine, and then take them through it 
religiously the same way every time. And that will aid in their visual engagement in that activity. And you can help. That's really helpful for parents is to identify four or five routines that you're going to systematize and then figure that out and then go through it with them. Okay. Um, just a couple more mi minutes. So um, I talked about this earlier. We want to make sure that whatever we're having them do is enjoyable to them. It's enjoyable to and interesting to them. So think about the textures and think about the colors and the lighting that you're using. And then I'm, I'm kind of reiterating. So, it, oh, okay. So these last few slides were some activities that I don't think we'll spend time doing because we're kind of reaching the end of our time. But um, I'll just, so I'll just sum it up in this way. We've gone through, we've talked through what the hard environment is. And we've talked to, in the hard environment with things like the, the materials that you're using, the way that you're setting up that environment, and think specifically about the different senses that um, the auditory sense, the visual sense, the tactile sense, and what those all are, um, what information the hard environment is, is giving to those senses, okay, so that you are supporting them as much as you can. And then think about that soft environment, and that gets into the relationships and the familiarity with the objects and the, just how calm the child can be so that they can focus on their, their vision in that activity and in that environment. So think about those two things, and you can apply that to every piece of their day and make it so that every piece of their day is as supportive as you can make it. On, at the same time, let me say that spending 24 hours a day on vision is going to be too much for a child with CVI. And so you may very well decide that certain parts of the day are not going to be visual parts of the day, and that's fine. I mean, that's really important, actually. You don't want the whole day to be visual. But we definitely want um, um, a number of parts of the day to be visual, and so you're going to need to support that. Okay, so as we close, are there any additional questions that you have before we... We do have a couple of questions. Um, one, Jeannie um, wants to know if there are certain types of toys you would uh, like to introduce other than red ones or quiet toys. Uh, you may have mentioned this already, but just to reiterate that. Sure. You know what? Let me flip through some of these slides that I, that I had in here. So here's some ideas. So bottle feeding, you can encourage visual engagement. We've put, some, uh, we've put something on that bottle. Um, book reading. Well, we talked about this a little bit. Um, here's some lighted objects. This is a um, this is somebody in the bathtub, and there's those um, glowing sticks that have been thrown throughout the bath. But oh goodness, any kind of, any kind of toy, just think simple. So a simple shape, one color, um, that makes it it easier to see by having one or two colors on the. It doesn't have to be red. But one or two colors on the object will be really helpful. Okay. Um, we had one other question, and I'm going to put this out there. Um, uh, but I wanted, before I do that, I want to just remind folks you'll get a survey at the end, um, an email and a survey. But I'm going to leave, um, end with Mindy addressing this question. Sarah wants to know if there's any special guidance on helping children with CVI feel less fearful about walking in their environment. Um, oh, goodness, yeah. Uh, so you would have to, I need like a whole evaluation to find out what, what exactly is going on with that child's vision. So um, that fear could be for a lot of different reasons. So I'm not sure I can answer that question without seeing the child. But here's some ideas. So are they fearful of um, not having... Uh, so are they unable to, do they not know where they're going? So some kids have problems with routes. And we usually teach that by taking isolated pictures of, of, of very um, um, landmarks, specific landmarks within the route, and then putting those in a book and then teaching them those landmarks. Because a picture, we can zoom in and get rid of the visual clutter. And then within that book, we're going to, zoom out a little bit and a little bit and a little bit more 
so that we're progressing them, we're scaffolding their visual learning as far as understanding complexity within their environment. Or is that visual fear because of the noise level? Or is that visual field because, fear because of the visual clutter in the environment? Um, or is that visual fear because a lot of kids that have CDI have issues with depth perception, and so that can cause some visual fear? Um, so see what I'm saying? I can't really answer that question because there's so many reasons that that could be happening, but a very good, so an orientation mobility specialist doing a full evaluation to figure out what those fears are, and then addressing that would be my recommendation. Well, I want to thank you, Mindy. This is, was such a great webinar. It sounds like we can probably have enough information for a part two at another time, so probably, uh, probably, probably. so awesome ideas. Um, folks, thanks for participating, and um, we do have the webinar recorded. Um, I don't know how long it takes to get it up on our um, site, uh, so just kind of keep an eye out for on our, let me put these pages up here, our um, Facebook um, pages and um, our YouTube pages as well, and um, we'll have it up there at some point. Thanks, folks. We'll see you next time. Um, have a great rest of your day, and um, as of now, the webinar is complete. Have a great day. Thanks.